Over at Conservative Review, Trump should know playing by the rules isn't stealing. By Robert Eno. The race for the Republican nomination for the presidency increasingly looks like it will go to an open convention in Cleveland. I have made this point myself. I don't know, just looking at the numbers. It's virtually impossible for any candidate to get a majority of the delegates, he writes, 1237, prior to the GOP convention. The reality of this situation has seemingly gotten under the skin of Donald Trump as he is increasingly calling the nominating process unfair. It's unfair. They're stealing it from me. There's Trojan horses everywhere. They're out to get me. Doc, Harry, they're out to get me! Um, let's continue. The rules of the nominating process to be the general election candidate of the Republican Party for the presidency were set before the process began. In fact, they were set before Donald Trump announced he wanted to run for president. At least in regards to delegate allocation, selection, and binding, the call of the convention was finalized on November 30, 2015. I don't even know if Donald Trump was a Republican back then. The call outlined the rules of the primary and caucus season, went through exact delegate allocation, and outlined general guidelines on how each state can select and bind delegates. This was available two months in advance of the first primary. There are 56 different state, territorial, or federal district Republican parties. Each one had their own rules for selecting delegates. Besides the carve-out for the first four states, it was known that no state could hold a winner-take-all contest. The only other major rule that constrained state parties said that if a state binds delegates, the three state members of the RNC must also be bound. Other than that, each state was free to choose how it would bind or not bind delegates and how the delegates were selected. Every single candidate knew the rules beforehand. When we return, we'll hear some more. I know facts, facts, facts. Mark, Mark, what's with the facts, facts? We just want to make America great again. Because of the large field of candidates at the beginning of the process, as Zeno writes, many people have been predicting an open convention from the beginning. Some campaigns have been preparing for that as part of their campaign strategy. The tr- campaign was not. They didn't even hire someone to be in charge of delegates until after they started losing the delegate selection conventions and caucuses. It's almost too late. And as the saying goes, piss poor planning prevents proper performance. I didn't know that was a saying. Never got that in any of my fortune cookies. While he has decried the rules as being unfair, Trump himself has benefited from them. (gasps) Trump has benefited from the rules? Yes. He's obtained a greater proportion of delegates than his proportion of the votes up until now, and the rules have allowed him to do it. Trump has received 37% of the vote in those states that have held binding caucuses and primaries, but he has earned 46% of the delegates. That's almost 10% more delegates than if the Republican contests were completely proportional. (sighs) don't, 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 Don't tell anybody that. Maybe somebody should tell some of the geniuses with whiteboards over at the Fox News Channel. (gasps) The Republican nominating contest, in fact, is geared towards helping the front runner. This is for a variety of factors meant to accelerate the coalescing around a nominee. Those factors include thresholds for delicate allocation, winner-take-all contests, and a winner-take-most rules that give all delegates in a proportional primary to someone who earned over 50% of the vote. The rules were changed in 2012 to benefit the front-runner at the behest of Mitt Romney. That Trump has been unable to fully capitalize on these rules is nobody's fault but Trump's. This is especially true given that Donald Trump has benefited most from the rules, the rules that benefit the front-runner at every turn. This was most notable when he won the Florida primary. He won 99 delegates in a fractured field, which he now decries. He did so with less than 50% of the vote. He got 99 delegates with less than 50% of the vote. Now here's another way at looking how the rules have actually benefited Trump. He has needed far fewer votes per delegate than any other candidate over this season. For instance, he's needed about 1,200 fewer votes per delegate than Cruz, Rubio, and Kasich have needed. And they've had to get almost double that. So contrary to Trump's claims, the rules have actually been stacked in his favor. That is not prepared, that he is not prepared to take advantage of them is in his own fault. Things like running a country in a campaign are complex. 
They involve rules. They require a person to execute them. Perhaps Trump's inability to use the rules, writes Eno, which have been stacked in his favor, to win the nomination are a real indicator that he's unready to lead the country. Robert Eno. So Trump has gotten 37% of the popular vote in these primaries and so forth. And he walks away with so far uh, 46 or 47% of the delegates. It's unfair. One person, one vote. I heard somebody say, look, we ought to get rid of the Electoral College. This is how crazy this phony populist movement has become, the progressive populists. Only the people should decide public policy. Only the people. Really. Only the voters should decide public policy. Well then, ladies and gentlemen, we're in deep trouble because then our rights are not unalienable. Then our rights are not God-given. Then our rights don't belong to us regardless of government, regardless of majority rule. I don't know about you, but I don't want people voting on my property rights. I don't want people voting on my individual sovereignty. I don't want people voting on any of these things. Some things are non-negotiable because they're God-given, not given by a majority of our fellow citizens. That's the whole point of the establishment of this nation. That's the whole point of the Declaration of Independence. That's the whole point of the Constitution. People don't get to vote on your rights. Yeah, but the public gets to decide. No, they don't. There's a lot of things the public ought not to decide because it's none of the public's damn business in your life, in my life. I mean, I don't go to my neighbors and say, let's have a vote on how many weapons I can have in my house and how many bullets I can have. Hey, no, the public gets to decide. I don't go to my neighbors and say, is my house too big? Is it too small? What do you think? I don't go to the neighbors and say, what kind of car should I own? Should we have a vote? There's a lot the public doesn't get to decide. And as conservatives, we understand that. No, but I'm a populist. Oh, really? Well, where does populism end? At your driveway? In your house? In your religion? Everything is not put up to a vote. And everything's not about popularity. There's right and there's wrong. This is fundamental. It's fundamental to most faiths, and it's fundamental to our constitutional system. It's not always about majority rule or plurality rule. Some things are what they are because they're God-given, and they belong to each of us as a human being. So everything isn't put, hey, well, the popular will, the electoral college, yeah, we ought to get rid of all these things. This is what I mean by progressive populists. People have no understanding about why we have an electoral college. And they're not going to take three minutes to investigate it. Doesn't matter. Hey, I'm a populist. That's all that matters. You know, the founders made the point that the time should ever come when the people could vote in ways that would give them access to the treasury, the country would be destroyed. The country would be destroyed. And that's exactly what's happening. You can call it populism, statism, progressivism. But it's all the same in this regard. So no, everything isn't up for grabs. Everything isn't about a plurality of the people or a majority of the people. Hey, we the people get to decide. Really, really. No, no, sometimes you just don't. And you should thank God that sometimes you just don't. Some things are constitutional and some things are not. Some things are moral and some things are not. Some things are just our own possession as individuals, our own individual sovereignty, and some things are not. So don't hand me this populist crap like the progressive crap. Hey, you know what? What? We the people! And, and it's amazing. The people, we the people, they're the 37 percenters. They're not even the majority. Hey, we don't want a majority on the delegates. It's got to be a plurality. Well, what about we the people? Hey, forget about that. Just pointing that out. The hypocrisy, nay, the idiocy. The idiocy, that's right, the idiocy. Katrina Pearson, you know, one of the things Trump could do is get rid of this goofball. She is a complete goofball. Just friendly advice, which I give free of charge. Although I've been accused of being a Soros frontman. I'm a Soros frontman, don't you know? And I'm an establishmentarian. Uh, Katrina Pearson, a Trump spokeswoman on MSLSD today, with Andrea Mitchell, a Hillary Clinton spokeswoman, if you will. Cut five, go. 
That is a one tough statement. What proof do you have that there was actual coordination between Ted Cruz and the super PACs? That would be illegal. Well, absolutely, and I think that's why Mr. Trump mentioned that in the statement. And my colleague earlier had mentioned the, the idea of having an event and the senator speaking there. So there's obvious coordination there. Um, they didn't just accidentally happen to be at the same place at the same time with the same goal. Uh, not to mention some of the surrogates two weeks before Melania Trump was attacked. There were campaign surrogates talking about the exact same attack ad that came out by another super Okay, pack. so she has no evidence whatsoever. Because if she does, her Bosch should bring a lawsuit. You know, like the one he brought challenging Cruz's citizenship. <gasps> Mr. Producer, did he bring that lawsuit? I don't think he did. They don't even talk about it anymore. Or the lawsuit he was going to bring because of he defamation. <gasps> he didn't bring that lawsuit either. Maybe there's another lawsuit, the obvious illegal coordination between the Trump campaign, excuse me, the Cruz campaign and some super PAC. It's blatant. It's out. Oh. Oh, look at this. It's obvious because Katrina Pearson says it is. They're committing acts of illegality, serial acts of illegality right there in front of everybody in daylight. And yet nobody's doing anything about it. The system again, it's just the system. Good God. The people have spoken. What people? The 37 percent. Oh, the people have spoken. That's right. The rules are corrupt. What rules? The rules we don't like. Oh, the ones that have been in place. Yes, they're corrupt. And watch. The rules are corrupt. So one rule needs to be changed to help them. The majority requirement that's been in place since 1856. I've said it so many times. You'd think the backbenchers would pick it up by now. And that rule, that's the only rule that should be changed. Why? Because it helps Donald Trump. It does? Oh, yes. It's a plurality. Our juggernaut of national populist agrarianism, the Buchananism, the Perroism, and all kinds of other isms. Yes, yes, it's a juggernaut. But we can't get the majority because, look, Cruz is a Trojan horse. He's taken money from the Bushes, and he's part of the Soros machine, and the establishment is with him. And he's a, did I say he's a Trojan horse? Yes, he's a Trojan. Hey, look. That's right. Did you know his wife works for Goldman Sachs? <gasps> Did they say Goldman's Goldman Sachs? You mean one of the same financial institutions that has worked with Donald Trump? Hey, he was a businessman. What do you expect them to do? That's what businessmen do. But Heidi Cruz? She worked at Goldman Sachs? Yes. Well, at least she didn't work at ExxonMobil. That's right. And can you imagine if she had worked at Halliburton? Halliburton? Oh, my God, Halliburton, too? Yes. Maybe she's part of the Bilderbergers. What's that? I don't know. But it sounds like trouble. This I know. 